Welcome everyone, my name is Joe Steinfield, and this is the second season of Stories to Share, which is a presentation of the Jaffrey Civic Center. We have a good crowd here at the center, and a number of people are joining us online. I see a number of familiar faces from last season, and we will be back starting today and each first Friday of the month until next May. Now today we have to kick off this season Ernie Hebert. Ernie was born in Keene and has lived most of his life in Cheshire County uh, with a departure to California where he attended Stanford after having graduated from Keene State. And in college, Ernie shifted from history to English literature, with a particular emphasis on poetry. And he's been writing ever since. And teaching, I should add. He taught at Dartmouth College for a long time, and he has the notable distinction of being the first fiction writer to attain tenure at Dartmouth, and what it says on the Dartmouth website, quoting Ernie, is, it's been my mission as a novelist to write about working people without idealizing or demeaning them and without standing them up against the wall to represent some political ideology or notion of the author. I'm especially interested in the interior lives of working people, a territory ignored by most literary writers. You know, he created the fictional town of Darby, New Hampshire, and has written many books set in that community, and now he's come out with a book called Whirly Bird Island, back to Darby, New Hampshire. Here's what the Concord Monitor says about Ernie. His novels are replete with characters. Some of them, like the people he grew up with in his native Keene, who rely on their determination and grit. More than anyone among New England letters, Hebert has held up a mirror to working people. Now, Whirly Bird Island, while it is set in Darby, is something different for Ernie. First of all, it's a murder mystery. Inspired by Ernie's father and the generation of men who fought in World War II and then returned to civilian life, still paralyzed by the horrors they witnessed in war. Last year, Ernie won the Lifetime Achievement Award from the James and Ewing Arts Program, a notable distinction. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Ernie Hebert. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this uh, because uh, if I started to talk, I would just ramble, and who knows where that would go. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Jaffe Civic Center, uh, Joe Steinfield. Uh, and Ed, uh, who helped make it, and everybody uh, who helped make this possible for me to be here today. I also want to thank a group of military veterans who meet weekly at the Brattleboro American Legion for inspiring me uh, in the writing of this essay. My topic tonight revolves around an idea that came to me in 1968 when I was a student at Keene State College but which has its origins much earlier when I was a toddler during World War II, an idea that refused to die until I could purge it through a work of fiction. For me, 
Writing novels is an attempt in metaphor to clear the ledger of unfinished business in my mind. Every book I've written has a long and often intensely personal backstory. What follows is one section of the backstory of Whirly Bird Island. My father, L. Fage Hebert, at age 33, with a wife and two little kids, was drafted into the Navy in World War II. I'd like to show how that short period of time changed not only his life, but created the conditions that shaped my life. I also want to show how war trauma steered the lives of my closest friends growing up in Keene. The fine point I want to make is that war, any war, changes usually not for the better, not only the lives of the combatants, but also of their progeny, and by extension, the world we live in. My mother, Jeanette Vacrist, a Manchester, New Hampshire native, but one steeped in French, Canadian, Roman Catholic culture, had been a nun in Quebec from ages 18 to 23 before leaving the convent and moving back to the States to enter nursing school at Notre Dame Hospital in Manchester. She did not have a crisis of faith. She remained devout her entire 85 years of life. She left the convent because she wanted a family. Elphage, like Jeanette, came from a family of Canadian immigrants, and he was fluent in French as well as in English, as well as in English. Uh, our name uh, might be Aber in Quebec or South Louisiana, Hebert in Nova Scotia, Hebert in standard America, but Dad pronounced it Hebert in an old style local Yankee accent you don't hear much anymore. He had only six, seven, or maybe eight years of schooling. I don't know the exact number because he was never sure himself. He was uh, 14 or 15. He went to work at International Narrow Fabric Company in Keene, a cotton mill uh, on Congress Street. If you want some insight into such a, piece, a place, take a look at the first chapter of my novel, The Dogs of March. I worked in that sweatshop the summer between my sophomore and junior years of high school. 55 hours a week, 10 hours Monday through Friday, five hours Saturday mornings in sweltering heat, dirty air, and dangerous machinery in those days before OSHA. Dad worked the same hours, alternating one week days, one week nights for 45 years. At the end of the summer, Dad said, how did you like working in the shop? I, sa <laughs> I said, I didn't. He said, good, I don't ever want to see you in there again. In 1939, my mother, now an RN, took a position as what we would call today a nanny to care for children of the Cabot family in Dublin. Uh, the Cabots uh, had a house in Hanover and a mansion in Dublin on Snow Hill Road known perhaps to some of you in this audience as the Pompelli House, built by architect Raphael Pompelli. I'm curious, anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah I thought so. Uh, this is the Pompelli House, and uh, it, it has since burned, it's gone. Uh, when I was in college, um, uh, I had a friend who just happened to be house-sitting for this building. Uh, because it was long since been abandoned by the family to, who you know, just didn't have the, the money by then to, to keep it up. And uh, I can tell you that the, the, gro the ground floor was grand. It was like being in a uh, city museum, fireplaces that had logs like five, six feet wide. Just really spectacular place. And the second floor, there were suites uh, for, the, uh, for the owners, the, the Cabot family, in the Pierce family, there were two families there. Uh, and the third floor was all little tiny rooms where the servants uh, were. And uh, my mother tells the story that there, was, there were so many servants, it was a guy whose only job was to polish things. That's all he did. That'll give, that'll give you an idea. Uh, 
Uh, oh, yeah, I got to say that this image is from uh, uh, The Monadnock Summer by William Morgan. It's a wonderful book if you, if you like uh, history of architecture. Uh, uh, my mother had a friend who was an upstairs maid. Her boyfriend from Keene showed up one day on his motorcycle. Accompanying him on an Indian brand motorcycle was his pal, Elphage Hebert. Jeanette and Elphage double dated at the Curvin Club in Winchester, Winchester, Massachusetts. They discovered they had two things in common. Neither drank alcohol and they both spoke French. Uh, they were virgins when they married in July of 1940. He was 27, she was 31. I was born 10 months later on May 4 in Elliott Community Hospital in Keene. Uh, that's my dad on the left, my mom on the far right. Dad is, uh, was five feet eight at his top, top height. Mom was five feet two. But the woman in the middle is my, is my mother's mother, my grandmother, or as we would say in French, my memère. I'm not sure when that picture was taken, but. Uh, after Dad left the boot camp in San Diego, Mom moved with her then two sons, Omer, age one, and me, age three and a half, from our apartment on that long block on Baker Street, if you know Keene, if that block is still there, uh, to be near her infirm mother and brother, pastor of St. Joseph's Catholic Church in Epping, uh, which in those days was a little farm town. I have no memories of my father until after he returned from the Navy. My first memories of a, sig of a significant male in my family were of my mother's brother in Epping. He was not only a father figure for me, but for my mother because he was 14 years older than she was and took the male lead of the family when their own father died young. My mom's brother's name was Joseph Ernest Vackerst. Uh, my full name is Joseph Ernest Vackerst Hebert. As a boy, I was frequently reminded that I resembled Father Vack, as he was frequently called. Nobody ever said that I looked like my real dad, who was light-complected with startling blue eyes. Dad was shy and uneducated, a faithful reader of the Keene Sentinel and the American Legion magazine, but I never saw him with a book in his hands until I published one. By comparison, Father Vack was extroverted, highly educated, well-read, and intellectually curious. He spoke four languages plus American Sign Language, which he learned so he could communicate with a deaf parishioner. He possessed a charismatic personality. In retrospect, I can say that he was unlike any priest I've ever met. He was a fisherman and hunter, with an extensive gun collection that my, I and my brother used to play with all the time. He liked driving fast cars. He was a heavy drinker and smoker and enjoyed the company of men like himself. For example, one of his epping friends and a fishing buddy was Jack Sharkey, a former heavyweight boxing champion. When I was around age 12, Father Vac taught me the rudiments of boxing. Tips, no doubt, he picked up from Jack Sharkey in which came in handy uh, in school. Uh, I, I tell you, I, uh, I googled uh, uh, Jack Sharkey and somehow found uh, a line where Sharkey uh, had another fishing buddy who used to go to, they used to go to mass at my uncle's church. The other fishing buddy was Ted Williams. <laughs> when I was 11 and Omer 9, Father Vac took us on an excursion to New York. He didn't wear his black priest suit. He was in civvies. We were on top of the Empire State Building when I spotted the Statue of Liberty. France gave that to us, I said. My uncle had a big, booming voice, uh, and he said with some sarcasm, yes, France gave that to us, and we have paid them back many times over. <laughs> Two women tourists from Paris overheard and remarked to one another in their own language on the rude American. Father Vac understood that he had given offense and immediately went over to the women and spoke to them in French. I don't know what he said, 
but they were soon smiling, and in the end, we all went to lunch. <laughs> uh, that was the kind of man he was, and that was the kind of man I wanted to be. Uh, Uh, that, that's uh, Father back when he was uh, later in life when he was the Monsignor. It's a, I think it's a phony up photograph, you think? Can you tell looking at it? No, uh, Excuse me, I, I don't have a COVID or anything, but I do have a runny nose, which I've had since I was about 10 years old, by the way. Um, I did not adjust well when Dad came home uh, from the Navy upon the conclusion of World War II. I decided that Father Vack was my dad and this new guy was an intruder. I, I probably would have gotten over this child's mindset pretty quickly under normal circumstances, but Elf H. Hebert had been traumatized by something that happened while he was at sea with the United States Navy. We moved back to Keene with the idea that uh, Dad would return to work in the cotton mill, it happened, but not right away. In my mind, home was the St. Joseph Rectory in Epping, where I had spent my most pleasant and secure hours and where French was the language of conversation because my grandmother, my memere, spoke no English. French was also the language of my parents' romance and household chatter, which was why French was the first language I learned and which later I studiously unlearned because it wasn't cool when my family moved back to Keene and I started kindergarten at Lincoln School. So yes, language adjustment was a problem for me, but the bigger problem was dad. His nonviolent but abnormal behavior had a strong effect on me. He would get dressed in suit and tie every morning as if it were Sunday we were going to church. He would sit by a window in the parlor and stare at the outside world. He did not relate to me, nor to my mother, nor to my brother. It was as if he did not see us. It was like living with a ghost. For six months, he was unable to go back to work, and for a long time after that, he was uncommunicative. Uh, my way of dealing with my dad over the ensuing years was to distance myself from him. In my mind, he was an authority figure like a police officer or a school principal who happened to live in our house, someone to defer to, but not someone to get close to or to emulate. I secretly reserved the role of father for my priest uncle. I even had disturbing and involuntary fantasies that Father Vac was my real father. In a way, this kind of thinking, uh, inventing stories to augment reality, later assisted me as a fiction writer. Eventually, Father Vack was promoted to Monsignor. His ambition was to be the first New Hampshire Catholic bishop with roots in French Canada. Alas, Monsignor Vacris never realized his dream. He died of a sudden heart attack at age 61 in 1956. I was 14. Uh, my life went into a tailspin. Everything I tried in high school led to failures. I was, unable to, I was unable to find a steady girlfriend. I almost had to repeat my junior year because of poor grades. My career as a football quarterback and baseball pitcher never materialized because I broke my wrist clowning around. I got into fights. The sum of my accomplishments listed in Keen High's 1959 yearbook reads, quote, bowling two and three, unquote. Uh, it took me decades to realize that I was grieving. Uh, a month after I turned 17 in May of 1958, I joined the Keen unit of the United States Army Reserve. Directly upon graduation a year later, I served six months active duty in Fort Dix, New Jersey for basic infantry training and advanced schooling as a supply clerk. I am grateful to the airborne sergeant who taught me QWERTY on a typewriter. It was a skill that came in handy in future years. I wrote my first novel on a desktop manual Underwood typewriter that I inherited from Father Vac. That typewriter, which my mother dug out of the attic, seemed like a magic wand to me. The Dogs of March is dedicated to Father Vac. 
As for the typewriter, I still own it. It still works. After the military, I went to work for New England Telephone and Telegraph Company installing dial systems in phone company central offices all over New England. I bet you didn't know that White River Junction uh, was, and maybe for all I know still is, the toll switching center for all of northern New England. Uh, it was soon clear to me that I had neither the aptitude nor the passion for telephone work. I envisioned a career similar to my high school experience, dominated by frustration and mediocrity. What kept me on the job was the paycheck, the comfort of a union, and the fact that it wasn't like my dad's cotton mill, a sweatshop. In the succeeding uh, transitional period of my life, two people stepped up to help me. One was the first girl I was serious about. Let's call her Moira. The other, let's call him Bob, uh, was my closest boyhood friend going back to first grade at St. Joseph's Elementary School in Keene. They were both serious-minded college students. I'd always been a reader, but Moira and Bob improved the quality of the books I read by recommending reading matter they came across in their studies. Besides youthful intellectual curiosity, we had something else in common, fathers traumatized by war. War, in a very real sense, shaped our future lives. Moira came from money, not big money, more like enough to get by comfortably money, which was a good thing because her father, as far as I know, never held a job for long and failed in the business enterprises he took on. I remember him as kind of non-committal. I learned later that he was one of those solitary alcoholics who just wanted to be left alone and could not seem to relate to the world. He was more or less MIA from his family. He had been a bomber pilot during World War II whose plane crash landed in Germany, or maybe he bailed out. I, I can't remember the details. He and his wife had two daughters. The younger one died in middle age after a life of alcoholism and drug abuse. The older daughter, my love interest, uh, joined the Red Cross to serve in Vietnam. It was an experience that marked her for life, although I don't think in a productive way. Moira had uh, one bad marriage and a decades-long affair with a married man that did not end well. There was something missing in both of these smart, beautiful, and engaging women. I can't prove it, but I believe that their vulnerabilities were related to the trauma that their dad suffered in war, elements of which he passed on to them. Bob's father was an alcoholic of a different order, a raging, self-pitying type who died before his time. He attributed his own debilities to the many months he spent in combat, as a combat infantryman in the front lines in Europe. His three sons could never respect him. In my estimation, they survived whole only because of the strength, good humor, and mental stability of their mother. It's my belief that so many of the unsung heroes of any war are the mothers. Uh, in those days of the draft, Bob wanted no part of military life. So upon graduation from college, he joined the Peace Corps and served in South America. When he returned to the States, he earned a PhD in Latin American studies and went on to publish a half a dozen scholarly books in Venezuela. I had another close friend, let's call him Vinny whose father used to brag about killing German soldiers, how he liked to shoot them in the ass. I saw the dark side of his character while on a hunting expedition when I was 15. I shot a rabbit with my 16-gauge Mossberg shotgun. I didn't like seeing the dead animal. But even worse was the sight of my friend's dad. It was easy to read his eyes and the expression on his face. He gloried in the killing. Feeney grew up with a divided sensibility. He was religious, a good guy with friends, loyal to his family, but with a Second Amendment mentality toward the rest of the world. And I'll leave it to my audience to uh, parse that last sentence. 
Somewhere along the line, I climbed out of my adolescent Hades through a combination of binge reading, long discussions with friends, life experience, and, I like to believe, beer. I began to get inklings of my future identity during my second stint of active duty in the U.S. Army. The Soviets started building the Berlin Wall in the summer of 1961. During that crisis, President John Kennedy activated National Guard and reserve, Federal Reserve units. I was called for a year and assigned to a National Guard artillery battery headquartered in Milford, New Hampshire. I pretended to be upset at this surprise deployment, but actually I found myself secretly giddy. I had an excuse to get away from the phone company. It was that surprise surge of elation that told me that the truth was I hated my job. When I, when I arrived by bus at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, First Sergeant Piper asked me what my MOS was. MOS is Army Lingo for Military Occupation Specialty. I said, supply clerk. He said, no, you're a cannoneer on an eight-inch howitzer. <laughs> for a young guy, Playing at war with real ordnance without, any, without anybody shooting back at you was more fun than any video game I can imagine. Today, in honor of the deafening noises produced by the Howitzers, I wear two hearing aids and I still can't hear very well. I made my first black friend at Fort Bragg. His name was Lathan Marshall. He was only two years older than I, but much more mature. He was a husband and father. Uh, that's on me on the right uh, at 21, uh, and that's Lathan. And you can tell who the better soldier is. Just look at the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and uh, the cigarette, which I eventually quit. Uh, anyway, Lathan was a good guy. Uh, two personal events changed my life uh, during this deployment. Event one, we were out in the field every day in the hot sun. So I was primed one weekend when one of the guys who had a car, what was then called a beach wagon, invited me and two other guys to go to Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. We hit the beach, worked on our tans, and tried unsuccessfully to pick up girls. That night, we slept fitfully in the beach wagon. Next day, we headed back to base, stopping at a bar for a beer. I noticed the bartender eyeing me. I had just turned 21, and I was sure he was going to ask me for my ID. Instead, he said, boy, unless you show me your ass is white, I'm not going to serve you. <laughs> we walked out of the bar. I had known why Lathan and the other black guys in our battery never left the post. Now I could feel, as well as understand, just a teensy bit of what was behind the why. I didn't know at age 21 whether I wanted to vote Republican or Democrat. My parents were, my father was a Republican, my mother was a Democrat, so I was kind of torn. After the incident in South Carolina, I decided I would favor whatever party uh, championed civil rights. Event two occurred toward the end of my hitch with Uncle Sam. By then, I'd made friends with two older guys in my barracks, both college-educated men with careers I could only dream of. Chuck Gilson was a high school history teacher in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and Eddie Grimison was a fine arts painter from West Hartford, Connecticut. I was kind of a hanger-on uh, that they tolerated. I loved listening to them while they talked over my head. Eddie had a car on post, and one Sunday, I accompanied his, him and Chuck on a sightseeing uh, trip to Charleston, South Carolina. Chuck was an amateur photographer with a deep interest in church architecture. Uh, we sauntered around old Charleston. Chuck took pictures and Eddie made rapid sketches with watercolor paints. I began to experience that odd man out feeling as the two educated guys gab animatedly about this historical building or that. 
Finally, just to be noticed, I said something, I can't remember what, about a church. Chuck grimaced and said, it's a neo-Gothic monstrosity. That phrase, neo-Gothic monstrosity, was like a direct hit to my psyche from a 220-pound round fired by an eight-inch howitzer. I thought, if I could talk like that, I might amount to something. I decided then and there that I had to go to college. In the fall of 1964, I left New England Telephone and Telegraph Company and enrolled at Keene State College. Freshman year, I was tied with a senior for the highest grade point average in the school. It was the first time in my life that I had evidence that I could be good at something. Probably the worst year for the country in, in my adult life was 1968. Martin Luther King was assassinated April 4th, and Robert Kennedy June 6th. Protests of the Vietnam War brought out philosophical and ideological differences in the citizens of our country that continue big time to this day. Matters came to a head uh, during an anti-war rally on the KSC campus that I attended with my college friend and apartment mate, roommate. It was into the, I was into the spirit of the rally until the crowd started chanting Ho 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 Chi Minh. Suddenly I felt sick inside. Ho Chi Minh was the leader of the people who were killing American soldiers. I made my feelings known to my friend. Mad with the fervor of the moment, he said, you're either with us or against us. You know, it's a phrase that, that I hear now from everybody. I walked away. My feeling was, these people are all crazy. I'm crazy. Everybody I know is crazy. Also, everybody I don't know. I resolved my malaise by falling in love with a tall brunette. We made it legal through matrimony March 22nd, 1969. We're still together. She's uh, making supper, by the way. <laughs> She's in uh, West Milan. I hope, or that's what she tells me. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was during the madness of the Vietnam War that I began to think about the idea of trauma as a subject for fiction. I thought about my, uh, my friends uh, with fathers damaged by war. Uh, what struck me was not the battle fatigue of the combatants, but of the effect on their loved ones. I came up with a theory that the youth outburst of the 1960s had roots in trauma passed down to sons and daughters from their dads whose minds were messed up by war. Around this same time period, I decided that I was gonna be a writer. I asked myself, self, what do you know that you could write about that would be true to life? Self said, you know trauma, Ernie. You know its sights and sounds. You know its stink. I wanted to write a novel that contained the theme of war trauma passed down to the next generation. I conceived of characters very much like my dad and like the other screwed up dads I knew. I immediately started to write. Got to maybe a third of the way down the first page before I realized that one, I had neither the skills nor breadth of knowledge to write such a book, and two, I couldn't write in an honest way that, would, that wouldn't hurt my dad and all those other dads. They would recognize themselves. I abandoned my less than one page manuscript. Years passed and I went on to other ideas, other writing projects. I did notice that trauma played a big role in my writing even if I wasn't trying to write about trauma. And the theme of fathers and sons also kept reappearing in my work. Uh, in 2017, two years after retiring from college teaching and, I thought, fiction writing, it struck me that the old soldiers and sailors of World War II in my personal world had passed. A familiar voice in my head said, Ernie, they're all dead. You have to write that war trauma novel that's been nagging at you all these decades. I went right to work, but hit a wall early. I said to myself, self, what do you say? Self said, uh, you don't want to commit to another time-consuming and emotionally innovating 
writing project that is not going to make you any money. Enjoy your retirement. I went back to teaching myself to draw on the computer and to writing an occasional poem or smart-ass Facebook post, which, by the way, I love doing and still love doing. Life was good. Well, friend me if you want. <laughs> Life was good. I, I relaxed in the belief that I had wrung out all the authentic literature that was in me. Then I reunited with a cousin I hadn't seen since childhood. I knew that my father's brother had been a terrible alcoholic. It was, all, it was well known in family lore that he had shown up drunk for his daughter's wedding. My cousin told me that her father had been in the Battle of the Bulge. Furthermore, she revealed that her mother also had alcohol problems and she had been an army nurse. My cousin, an only child, said, my parents were not abusive, but it was kind of lonely growing up in that house. It wasn't just the words she spoke but the sorrowful way she uttered them, it was kind of lonely growing up in that house that moved me. I knew in the instant she spoke that I had to get off my ass and fulfill the idea for the trauma novel that had lodged in my head in 1968. Uh, quite to my surprise, it insisted on being a literary murder mystery that I named Whirlybird Island. A few years after my mother died, my father moved in with my own family when he was in his middle 80s. It was during this period that I not only got to know him better, but to love and respect him and to enjoy his company, in particular his sneaky sense of humor. When I asked it, uh, if he wanted a Playboy tape that I spotted on his dresser, he said, I'm working my way up to it. <laughs> Probably the biggest adventure was a road trip we took from New Hampshire to Texas so Elphage could visit with his goddaughter. It was during that journey that Dad told me about the event that traumatized him during the war. Seaman Elphage Hebert worked uh, in the engine room of an LCI, which stands for Landing Craft Infantry. As warships go, it was very small and lightly armed, and as far as I know, it never had a name. Dad always referred to it as the LCI. See, it's just a little tiny boat. It's only got one gun. I can't even see it. So, somewhere in the Pacific, among the Philippine Islands, the ship got stuck on a rock for five days. An anxious time for the crew. They were an easy kill for a Japanese destroyer. Finally, an American ship showed up to pull them off. Dad was doing his job alone in the engine room, which is you know, at the bottom of the vessel. Um, uh, when, the, when the craft was jerked off the rock, lurched to one side and knocked him over. He instinctively reached for a hatch to get out and discovered he had been locked in. Dad's panic was momentary, and he returned uh, to his work. It was only later that the trauma set in. He was upset, not because they had locked him in. He knew that the compartment had to be sealed. He was upset because nobody had told him he was the lone sailor to be put in a position to be sacrificed. I would have volunteered, he said. What it boiled down to was that instead of being presented a chance to be a hero, he was designated as a chump. The result, feelings of alienation and betrayal by his own people, especially the officers. You don't have to be shelled to be shell-shocked. Any number of events can shell-shock a person into a bad state of mind that metastasizes into a mental illness. And my guess is everyone here, at one time or another, has been touched by such an experience, either personally or indirectly through the pain and behavior of a loved one. War is an ideal petri dish to incubate personal as well as societal demons. Uh, this is uh, Dad's uh, gravesite at St. Joseph Cemetery in Keene. Uh, that's uh, I stand in my shadow. I can say I play with computers. <laughs> <laughs>
And I, I wrote what it says here. I'll face Joseph Hebert, F2. Fireman, that's F, F stands for fireman, which is what they called people who worked in the engine room. And I dedicated my novel to him. Uh, in my 81 years, my country has been involved in World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, an invasion of Grenada, two Iraq wars, a long Afghanistan war, and numerous warlike adventures all over the world. Some good things come out of war, but they are outnumbered by the bad things. One thing I know for sure, we are, all of us, here in this room, the sons and daughters of war. Thank you for coming to hear me. That's all I have to say. You don't have to be shelled to have shell shock. I think we'll all remember that one, Ernie. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Ed Watazek is our IT specialist. We have people online. Do we, Ed? Yes. So anyone who is participating online should feel free to use the chat line. And if there are questions, Ed, you'll let me know. Meanwhile, uh, you know, Ernie, in a way, this talk we've just heard seemed appropriately, I suppose, given your relationship with your uncle, like a confessional. Uh, and an intimate sharing of your own experience. Uh, <clears throat> you've written many, many novels. Uh, this one's a murder mystery, am I right? Yeah. I've started it, but I haven't finished it. Uh, what's your next novel about? <laughs> <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't saying. <laughs> Who I, in the audience? Yeah, I, I don't like to talk about work until it's done or nearly done. Uh, uh, you can jinx it, you know. I'm, I'm superstitious that way. Well, I don't blame you, and you might change your mind. <laughs> uh, questions? Who wants to begin? Yes. Are you, are you related to the Hebert that the Library Hall is named for? Is that... What, what, what's, what's the name? Hebert Hall, you know, the Keene Library. Uh, is the no, it's, it's not Hebert, it's Hebert Hall. Ah, all right. Well, that takes care of that question. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, 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 was on, I was on the building committee that... Uh, For the expansion. That, yeah, that, that, yeah, and uh, I think the, uh, the Cohen family in Keynes that was the biggest uh, producer, the uh, Kingsbury family uh, and uh, the Putnam family, th yeah. those three families, the Keene families, I think, built that, okay. that extension. Yes, can you stand up so we can all hear you? Oh, no. I find it really fascinating that the main mission of the Menedna Family Services, uh, just having its annual meeting, is the role of trauma in addiction. You would make a great case study for <laughs> Phil Weisick, uh, who wants to make everyone aware of where trauma starts in the lives particularly of kids, but post-traumatic stress that you're talking about is the same thing, isn't it? It is, but you know, uh, what I find interesting is how the language has changed. You know, I, uh, I don't know what it was called in the Civil War. I had it, I don't, does anybody here know what, what trauma was called in the Civil War? It had, it had a name, I can't remember what it was. But anyway, I know World War I, it was called uh, shell shock, yeah. which is very descriptive, isn't it? In World War II, it was battle fatigue, which is still descriptive, but a little less descriptive. And then in the Vietnam War, it became a post-traumatic stress disorder, which is you know, kind of a cl clinical uh, disorder without with, word, without too much emotion, without, without a metaphorical value. And now it's uh, 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 just an acronym, PTSD. So I think a, a, d a decline in the language tells you something. I'm not quite sure what but it tells me something. Someone else. How important was being a reporter at the King Sentinel to your development as a writer? <laughs> uh, you know, 
Dane, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> Did you, no, you, you worked as a reporter at the Keene Sentinel. That's right, that's right. How I, important I, was that to your development as a writer? That's right, that's right. Uh, uh, I, I worked at the Keene Sentinel. I, was, I, I started in sports. I was there for nine years. Uh, and... Uh, I, uh, when I was in sports, I used to, we, we used to go to, I used to go to games, you know, and uh, there was a, a guy who used to, used to uh, hang, hang out with me. Uh, he was, he was a uh, conscientious objector. Uh, and uh, we used to go to games together. Uh, and eventually he became a reporter, you know. Ernie, did that influence your writing, being a reporter? Did it influence your writing later on? I don't think so. I, I, I th what it influenced was uh, was my um, my ability to know people because I got to meet a lot of different people. But uh, I, I I I think that uh, uh, the newspaper style is deadly for a writer. I I think it's terrible. Uh, uh, I, I think I think that the, uh, you, you, if you if you work for a newspaper. You have to get out in time before the, the language uh, that you use to write stories e eats you up. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, fiction writing or, or poetry writing, which is the, the other thing I do, is uh, it's all about it's metaphor, uh, in, in, indirect. Uh, in the, you, you arrive at your meaning in, indirectly through, through metaphor and emotion. That's the opposite of how you learn to write for a newspaper, so I don't think that the newspaper writing is a, is a good groundbreaking for as a good background for the fiction writing. But I, I'm sure I, that there are a lot of I'm sure I'm wrong, but <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, you ever have that feeling where you believe something, uh, but you know you're probably wrong? <laughs> I mean, a lot of religious people. Ernie, what writers do you like? And this is the one they always have in the New York Times when they interview writers. What's the great novel that you've never read? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know. I haven't read it. Can I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I the, the writers, I was, I was influenced by uh, British modernist writers. Uh, George Orwell, probably... Number one, um, oh God, I'm, I'm I'm blanking on names, um, I, and I, I I kind of rejected uh, American writers. Uh, Hemingway, I, I couldn't identify it with anything Hemingway wrote. Uh, I thought that style was uh, kind of overly precious. I just didn't like him very much. Maybe too much like a reporter. Uh, I, li I liked uh, T. S. Eliot. Uh, Poet, the poet T. S. Eliot, uh, and uh, I say I'm blanking on names. Uh, the, the woman, e English writer, who wrote, oh, I don't know. Well, anyway, I, I will say that the first book I, I, I read, the first great novel I read, was uh, Lilla Cather's novel, uh, uh, Grace, uh, Death Comes Death for the Archbishop. Archbishop. Yeah. Uh, which which uh, I thought was a gr uh, which uh, was uh, was a groundbreaking novel for me when I was coming of age. It stayed with me. It stayed with me. And I actually went back and reread it uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, I, when I first read it, I thought this is the best book I've ever read. And when I went back to it recently, I thought this is the best book I've ever read. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you know, the, when the second in the second reading of that book. It's, it's really a love affair between two men, but there's, there's no sex in it. Mm -hmm. But it's about two men, both priests. And, and you can tell this, it, it's, it's, it's about them. It's a, it's, a, it's a really deep, profound love affair. It's a, it's a great book. It's, I, I just can't recommend it more. Other questions? Anything online, Ed? Was it Iris Murdoch, the British? 
I never read I, Iris Murdo. No. no. Or Margaret drowned. Well, as the one she drowned herself. Who was the? the Oh, Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf. What, what I, that, I couldn't think of the name. But, uh, what I, I was really uh, influenced uh, by her uh, interior monologue. If you read Virginia Woolf, so much of her writing is, uh, it's not about what's happening, it's about what's happening in people's heads. And, and, and when I started to write, uh, I, I, I picked up on that aspect of her writing uh, and I thought, you know, this, this, everybody has, listen, two lives. The, the first life you live uh, deals with your, uh, material, your material, the material world. You know, you, you, have, to, you have to eat, you have to you know, seek shelter, uh, you have to seek companionship, you seek a mate. It's all, uh, uh, you know, you go, to, you go to readings, it's the material world, it's, which we all know. But everybody has another life, which is the life Inside, everybody has a secret uh, life that, that uh, 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 and uh, I mean, I know my, my, my life, I don't know about your life, your secret life, but I know you've got one. Uh, or I think you have. Let's take, let's take a poll. Well, never mind. <laughs> uh, no, and, anyway, um, and, I, and I think when the, uh, when the real world, uh, there's the material world, comes into conflict with your imaginary world, now you've got a novel. Uh, and, and when I was writing, especially about working people, so, so many of the, of the uh, books that I read about working people, uh, they told you what they did, they told you what they said, and then the uh, author often would step aside and tell you uh, about their, their, seek, their lives from his perspective. My, my, my goal, uh, in writing about working people, or anybody really, not just working people, was that the, the, uh, the secret life was, was what uh, the novelist uh, should privilege o over, over the uh, material life. Uh, so that's, that's, that's my belief. Someone else? <coughs> I've, I've got a question. Um, Ernie, uh, so many uh, writers who were also college professors often wrote about their experience in the collegiate environment. Did that ever occur to you? Uh, no, I, 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 I loved my job at Dartmouth College teaching. I, I loved it, but I, but I treated it like a job. I went there, and when I went home, it, was, it was, wasn't part of me. Uh, it was like working at the shop, except it was a lot better job than working at International <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, I, and I don't, I never, I never went out of my way not to learn what was going on at, at the college. I didn't want to know what the politics were. I just, I just avoided uh, probably a lot of good stories. Uh, I, I, I will say that the, uh, I did have an angel there, somebody who I, Completely respecting who was, who supported me all the way through, and that was uh, President James Wright, uh, and uh, I had no idea that he was behind a, a lot of the uh, good things that happened to me at uh, Dartmouth until after I uh, retired, and he and I started to communicate. Uh, Jim Wright or James Wright, president of Dartmouth College, called himself the uh, the. the uh, he, he was a, 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 the, only, the only Marine uh, uh, who was, uh, you know, a l l lower echelon Marine to ever become president of a, of a major university. And uh, he was always writing, a, he, his, his, his books are all about uh, the American soldier, so I, I highly recommend him. Uh, but the um, college, I, I just didn't see the stories there that, I, that, that, inter that interested me. It was, it was a job. Yes. You said your father didn't tell you what happened in World War II until that trip to Texas. Um, had you ever discussed the war with him before then? You know, we, uh, we only talked uh, about it in general and kind of harmless, kind of harmless conversation uh, kind of stuff. He talked about 
Um, you know, they, the, the Filipinos like to eat fish heads. That was the kind of conversations we had. We didn't have any conversation of depth about, about war or even about his experience. You know, there's an old, old saying that these World War II uh, veterans uh, never talked about it, you know? Well, you know, uh, I think that was a big mistake. I think they should have talked about it. I think it would have been a lot better for them. They would have, a lot of them would have recovered from their traumas if they had talked about it. Uh, it would have been better for their families. As it is now, when they say, well, you never talked about it, it's, uh, it gives them a kind of, uh, of uh, sainthood that I don't think that, uh, uh, that they deserve nor, nor that it was good for them or the, or, or the American spirit. Um, I think they should have talked about their, their world. But I never talked about it with my dad. He never talked. He wasn't in, he didn't, it just didn't occur. It wasn't until he was in his 80s. Uh, I, I'm 81. Uh, so it wasn't, uh, so I, I, I know that when you reach uh, a certain age, usually it's around a little after 60, you, begin, you become interested in the, the past. Uh, because more fascinating to you. Uh, while he was, he was, he started talking about the past, and he talked mainly about things like playing hockey uh, when he was a kid. Uh, he talked about old Keen. He talked about how his grandfather, Alcid Abera. Uh, by the way, my my grandfather, my his father's name was Hebert, and his mother's was another Hebert. So the two Hebert's married. Uh, uh, his his uh, grandfather, Alcid Hebert. Uh, used to give him a dime now and then, it, and it just made his day. <laughs> he never forgot that. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of your novels are about how New England's changing, and so I was just wondering, what parts of Keene do you still recognize, or that you know have stayed the same, or you know endured? Well, you know, I I think that uh, uh, in a lot of ways, Keene is is the town that uh, that I grew up in. It hasn't changed in a lot of ways, and I think the main reason is there's no interstate highway that goes by there. Uh -huh. uh, so, and, uh, uh, so I, I, it's one thing I love about Keene. And, uh, uh, I, I don't think it's uh, changed all that much. Uh, uh, although, <laughs> you know, when we're driving here, there's a lot of traffic, you know? Yeah. That's, one thing that's, <laughs> that's one thing that's changed is the uh, cars. And, uh, you know, as uh, my friend Bruce uh, said, you know, it used to be that uh, if you were a middle class family, there was one car. Now, you know, uh, uh, he's got a car, she's got a car, and uh, the kids have cars. Uh, so every, almost a lot of middle class households look like parking lots, right? Uh, and then when they're all on the road together, it's like, you know, you get like thousands of people on the road. So I, 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 th and I, I think the, but the, to go to the essence of your question, I think what really changed uh, uh, the New Hampshire and Vermont was the interstate highways. Uh, it used to be that uh, go going to, driving to New York was a, was a day's, uh, from Keene, was a long day's trip. Uh, and uh, going to Boston was, 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 you know, wasn't that easy either. Well, when, once the interstates came in, all the liberals in, in, uh, in uh, in New York, came up I-91 and parked in, in Vermont, totally changed the culture of Vermont <laughs> from a farm state uh, to a, uh, a liberal bastion. And, uh, and the, uh, the, the conservatives in Massachusetts who despised the liberal Massachusetts decided, well, screw it, I'm gonna go live in New Hampshire on the east side and go up 93, uh, and they changed uh, that section. Uh, so I think that the, the, the state, uh, the two states, Vermont and New Hampshire, been changed politically uh, by the interstate highways. And uh, 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 culturally, I'm not so sure. I think that Jaffrey's seems to me a lot like it was when I, when I was a kid. And so is Keene. That's one reason I moved back to Keene. Uh, for, for me, a home is the uh, circulation area of the Keene Sentinel. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 any town in the circulation area I would live in. Uh, when, when my wife and I lived in Lebanon, uh, you know, when I was teaching at Dartmouth, uh, I was there for 26 years, uh, even though it was, it's only like 60 miles or so from the, from the county, uh, I, 
I might as well have been in Timbuktu. It just never felt like home. And there's nothing against the place, it just wasn't home. And I, can, I know that every time I leave, like my wife and I usually go south uh, every, every summer, every winter, and when I come back and come down on 12 and get that first view of Mount Monadnock, uh, I think I'm home. <laughs> that's, that's my feeling. And then, you know, my, my daughter lives in Washington State where they have Mount Rainier, that incredibly fantastic mountain. Well, and then we have little Mount Monadnock here. Well, I'll take Mount Monadnock. <laughs> well, on that note, no, no, okay, yes. Uh, just a comment online from Kathy L, who says, great to see and hear you again, Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> well, God bless you. If there is one. Well, I was going to say, in connection with the reference to Mount Monadnock, that the idea behind this series is to have speakers who are from the Monadnock region. And we did that last year. We're going, we have a full schedule of people this year, all of whom are connected to, live here, part-time or full-time. And the one thing I'm sure about is we are not going to run out of people who have <laughs> stories to share. <laughs> so Ernie, Ernie Hebert, thank you for sharing your stories with us. Uh, thank you all for coming. Now, uh, there is a reception. Please join us. November 4, the distinguished educator and writer, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, will be here. Slightly different format. I get to have a conversation with Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot. I don't know what she's going to say. I don't even know if we're going to give a few hints to each other ahead of time, but those of you who know her or know of her know that she is a very interesting person, also the author of several books, nonfiction. So, come back in a month. Thank you for coming today. Thank you.